If you have your Bible, I'm in 1 Peter, the second chapter today as you turn to there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. That's where we'll be looking today. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. As you find your way there, amen. Hear the word of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God bless the reading of his word, and his people said, Amen. Amen. Today I want to begin to talk to you on this Sunday, a new series that we're launching uh, called Mistaken Identity. Say that with me. Mistaken Identity. Some people uh, have uh, struggle with who they are and who they're not. Amen. There's a big struggle in our world today about who am I and who am I not and where do we find out the answer to that question? Who we really, truly are. Where do we discover our real identity? And I believe we discover it in Christ. Amen. And so we're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. Who are we? But before we do that, I want to talk about who we're not today. We've sung about it about the lies crumbling. The Holy Spirit has spoken to us about that already this morning, believing the lie. And I want to talk to you today about three lies that we're tempted to believe, and we want to replace those lies with the truth of God's Word. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, the text that we just read, I believe will go a long way toward helping us to do that. And so this morning, we're going to dig in to that idea of our identity. Last year, 14 million people in the United States had their identity stolen. They were the victim of an identity crime. Someone broke in, got a hold of their information, and either opened a fake account or got a hold of money or did something in their name. 14 million people. That's a pretty big deal, isn't it? I want to tell you, your identity is under attack in this country, right? And, and spiritually speaking, the Bible says we have an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if you let him, the devil will steal your identity. He will fill your mind with lies and he will have you confused about who you are and who you are not. Amen? God's Word gives us the truth, and today we're going to wrap our head around that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, the verses that we just read. We're chosen. We are holy. We are His own people. All these things are true about us. But I want to talk about the things that are not true this morning. Say, not true. I don't know if you've ever been to a carnival before and stood in the fun house, but one of uh, my favorite things to do as a kid was to go through the fun house. They had mazes, and they had these mirrors there. Do you remember the carnival mirrors? They were something to stand in front of. Now, everyone has their favorite, right? Nobody likes the one that makes you short and squatty, right? Amen. I, amen. I, I didn't like that one, and most of you didn't either. I, I love the one that made me tall and thin, amen? I've never been tall. <laughs> Amen. And so that was a fun one to stand in front of and pretend for a moment that I would be that tall one day, right? Yeah. The bottom line about all of those mirrors, though, is this. Every one of them is a lie. They lie to us. Those mirrors have a curved surface, so the light reflects off them in an awkward way, and it makes your brain read an image, a reflection of yourself that is not true. Say it's not true. And I want to tell you, this world is filled with carnival mirrors. You and I live in a world where the enemy constantly is trying to confuse us about who we are. He's constantly trying to muddle the picture and distort the image so we don't get a clear read on who we are. And I hope today that God will help expose some of the carnival mirrors in your life and you'll walk away understanding a little bit more about the truth of who you are. It's important to know who we are it's also important to know who we are not. Amen? To not allow the enemy to confuse us. And I want to give you three right from the text that we read just a moment ago. And the first one is this. You are not 
who you were. Say that with me. You are not who you were. Verse 10 reminds us, once you were not a people. Once you had not received mercy. Amen? That is past tense. There was a time in our life when we were not the people of God. There was a time in our life before we encountered the mercy of Christ and the grace of the Lord. There was a past time when we were very different people. And I want to tell you, the enemy would love to convince you today that nothing has changed, that you still are the same old person you were before you met the Lord. And the enemy will go to great lengths to try to convince you of that because if he can confuse you about your identity, if he can make you believe that nothing really changed for you when you met the Lord, then you will get stuck in the same old patterns that you used to be caught into. Paul describes who we used to be in Ephesians 2, the opening verses. At the NIV, it reads this way. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who were disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's who we used to be. That's the way the Bible describes us. In verse 12, he goes on and he says, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ without hope and without God in the world. I want you to, I want you to mark that last line down, all right? Because there are a lot of people in the world who want to confuse you about that. They say, oh, there's many ways to connect with God. No, my friend, if you are without, if, look, if you are separate from Christ, you are without God. In the world. Did you see it? If you are separated from Christ, you are without God. Well, you can know God without Jesus. No, friend, Jesus is the one who reveals who God really is to us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father any way except through me. If you are separate from Christ, you are without God, and you are without hope in this world. The only way to be connected to God is to come through Jesus. That's the only way. Amen. But if you have received Christ as Savior, then you are, you do have God in this world and you do have hope in this world. And these things may have been true of your past, but they're not true of your present. The bad news is who we used to be. But the good news is all that changed in a moment when we trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. The first three verses tell us about the past. But then verse 4, Paul breaks in and he says this. He says, but God, say that with me, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together in Christ for by grace you have been saved. Thank God for that. In 1 Peter chapter 2 where we just read in verse 10 it says, uh, you know, at one time you were not. He says once you were not a people but now, say but now. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now, say it again, but now you have received mercy. I love that. But God, but now. <laughs> we used to be cut off from God, separate from Christ, without hope and without God. There was a time we were not part of the people of God. There was a time we had not obtained the mercy of God. But now, but God. <laughs> Do you see it? He shifted everything for us when we trusted in Christ. Satan is the accuser of the brethren and he loves to lure us back into sin by making us think that we never left it. He plays the highlight reel of our past failures. He runs the TikTok video of your worst mistakes over and over on a loop in your mind. He plants wicked, vile thoughts in your brain. He tempts you to return to your old ways. And then, even if you resist the temptation, he accuses you you and says, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't even have thoughts like that. If you were really saved, you wouldn't even have temptations like that. What a dirty dog the devil is. He tempts you and then makes you feel guilty because you were tempted even if you didn't act on the temptation. It's a trick. It's a trap. It's an accusation. You see, if he can't get you to sin in the present, he'll try to make you feel guilty that you're even tempted to sin. Or he'll try to remind you of your past sins that have already been forgiven, that are already under the blood. Amen. 
The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Well, how do I know if it's God or the devil? Well, it's real easy. What is the effect of it on your heart? When the Holy Spirit convicts you, it is to draw you toward God. When the devil condemns you, it is to push you away from God. What is the effect on your heart? Does it have a drawing effect or does it push you away from Christ? If it's pushing you away, then it is likely false guilt and the condemnation of the devil. And you need to recognize it for the lie that it is and stand against it and say, No, the blood has made me clean. No, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. No, I used to be those things, but I've trusted Jesus and I've received mercy and God has saved and rescued me. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise today. The good news of the gospel is you're not who you were. Say that with me. You're not who you were. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Say were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Those things were past tense. You may have been anything on that list. You may have been everything on that list. Do you hear me? But as long as you can say it's were and not is... (laughs) you're in good ground today. Amen. I may have been any of those things or all of those things or any combination of them, but I have been justified. I have been sanctified. I have been washed by the blood of Jesus when I trusted in Christ. And that changes everything. That's our testimony today. Amen. We are not who we were. So you're not who you were. Amen. As John Newton said, the slave trader who wrote the turned preacher who penned the great hymn Amazing Grace once wrote, he said, I'm not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But I still am not what I used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's our testimony. Amen. I'm not what I'm going to be yet because he's not through with me yet. Amen? You remember the song we used to sing in kids' church? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. Amen? I'm not what I am going to be, but I'm not what I used to be. That is our testimony. We are on the journey toward that perfection. And our testimony is not perfection, yes, but it yet, but it is progress on that road. Amen. You're not what you were, you're not who you were. And number two, you're not what you feel. Say that with me. You are not what you feel. If the devil can't get me caught up in the past and make me think my past sins disqualify me, then he will try to trap me and make me think my present suffering disqualifies me. If, if you don't get stuck on yesterday, you can get stuck in today. How many of you know there's enough bad stuff happening around us today to get distracted and to lose heart and to be discouraged over? Amen? It's there. It's all around us. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Peter writes to us and he says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed." God's declaration over us is a resounding, I love you. I am for you. You are my child. But we go through suffering in this life. We face difficulty and hardship, trials and tribulations. And if the devil can't trip us by reminding us of our past sins, he shakes our confidence in God's love by pointing out our present suffering. 
And he tries to get us so fixated on what's going on that we begin to doubt God's love for us. And we say, as I said a few moments ago during our prayer time, if God really loved me, why would this be happening? Be careful of that. There's always a trap in that. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal you are going through as though some, something strange were happening to you. It often catches us off guard, doesn't it? But the Bible says it shouldn't catch us off guard. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So why are we caught off guard when we experience tribulation? Peter says, don't think it odd or out of the ordinary that a test or a fiery trial has come into your life. And yet we find it very odd and unordinary, don't we? <laughs> we somehow think that if God really loved us, he would spare us this, whatever this is, and you fill in your own blank today. But I want to tell you, God's word is very clear that that's not the way it works. When we're suffering, it is easy to feel forsaken, abandoned, forgotten, or worse. Sometimes we feel rejected, not valued, unloved by God. Maybe you even feel targeted by God. Sometimes you get so deceived, you actually begin to think that God is the one who's actively trying to harm you. Wow. Well, I'd love to talk to you about your theology on that because if that's what God does, then what does the devil do in your worldview? Amen? I mean, have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> if God can be that bad, I'd hate to see how bad the devil is when you come to think of him. Amen? No, no. The enemy is the one who's coming to rob, to steal, to kill, to destroy, to bring havoc and hardship into our lives. The Lord is there to stand with us and to strengthen and to turn it for our good and to rescue and to walk us through. Amen. Sometimes it is hard to feel God's love when we're going through the fire of difficult times. When you're suffering, it's easy to forget that he loves you. It's easy to lose sight of it. Paul reminds us, though, that God has forever settled the question of whether we are loved by entering into his, our suffering for us. God's love, he, it, the proof of God's love is not that we never suffer. It is that Christ entered our suffering along with us to redeem us and to rescue us. We must forever settle the question of God's love by looking to the cross. I quoted it a few moments ago, Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. A few verses back in verse 35, he says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall hardship or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Regardless of what sufferings I may be facing today, whatever my fiery trials mean, I know what they do not mean. They do not mean that God has abandoned me. They do not mean that God is against me. They do not mean that God has forsaken me or is singling me out to harm me. No, no. How do you know that, Pastor? Because the cross tells me the answer. Do you know that God loves you? Yes. Whether things are going well for me or whether things are not going well for me, I know that God loves me. Why? Calvary answered that question a long, long time ago. But God proved His love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Anchor the answer right there. Anchor your heart right there. God loves me. How do you know? Because you had a good week? No, because He sent His Son to die for me. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. That's how I know God. God loves me. Jesus and his cross are the proof of God's love. Amen. Don't measure it by what kind of week or what kind of year you're having. Measure God's love by the measuring stick of the cross. And you will always walk away knowing, not just feeling, knowing that you are loved and that you are cared for by God. Amen. 
Feelings are like the warning light on the dashboard of a vehicle. I remember I took my Camry in one time and I had this little engine light that kept popping on. And, and I was thinking, what in the world? And I would go in and he would check it out and, and he would reset the button and then a week or so later the light would pop back on again. And I would take it back. Finally, he realized... He said, it's just a sensor that's gone bad. There's nothing wrong with the engine. There's something wrong with the sensor. Now, I, I said, well, what do I do? He said, well, I could replace the sensor, but it really doesn't do you any good. It doesn't mean anything. I said, yeah, but that little light gets on my nerves. He said, oh, I can fix that for free. I said, really? He said, yeah. He went and got a piece of black electrical tape and put it over the top of that little light. He said, there you go. No charge. Your feelings are like that little light on the dashboard. It's a warning light. Whenever you feel something, it's a warning light. And sometimes your feelings alert you that something really is wrong. Now some of you feel guilty and separated from God. If you've never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, you are guilty and separated from God. Okay, That's a very true feeling. <laughs> and you're feeling it and it's warning you that there really is something wrong and you need to get that dealt with. You need to fix that. You need to bring it into the car into the shop and you need to let Jesus do something for you. Amen? You need to let God forgive your sin. You need to put your faith in Christ. But sometimes, even though God has forgiven us, the enemy will try to bring false guilt. Sometimes, even though we know God loves us, he will use our present circumstances to try to change our mind. And our feelings will bother us. What do you do when your feelings are registering something that isn't true? You put a piece of electrical tape over them. <laughs> you move on. You don't just ignore them, but you don't let them convince you that something is wrong when nothing is wrong. We live by faith, not by feelings. We live by faith, not by feelings. We live by faith in what God has said in His unchanging words. Sometimes something is wrong under the hood. Sometimes the sensor is bad and there's nothing wrong at all. You are not who you were. Say that with me. You are not who you were. You are not how you feel. Say that with me. You are not how you feel. And finally this morning, you are not where you fell. Say that with me. You are not where you fell. I'm not talking about the past. I'm talking about last week. The reality for us is this. For many of us as Christians, it isn't the distant failures of our past that cause us to doubt and question. It's the more recent failures since we came to know Jesus. Has anybody stumbled since they met the Lord? Five or six of us? The rest of y'all lying up in church. You stumbling right now. I don't know it. You stumbling. <laughs> yeah. Stumbling over your pride. Yeah. James says, brothers, we all stumble in many ways. And all God's people said, amen. If we're honest, we know that James is telling the truth when he says that. And he's writing to Christians. He's writing to people who know the Lord. We stumble in many ways. Listen to me today. Verse 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. What is he saying there? He's telling us that. Uh, verse, the New King James says, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Your evil desires still wage war against you and try to trip you up. And if you give in to them, they will do great damage to your walk with God. Hear me today. Before we met the Lord, we were a slave to sin. And the wages of our sin was death, spiritual separation from God, both now and in eternity. But when you trusted Christ, God forgave you your sins for Jesus sake. His death freed you from sin's penalty. Say sin's penalty. I don't have to be afraid of facing hell or the judgment of God because of my sins that have been forgiven. Why? The death of Jesus stands in the place of my death. Jesus' death took my, he took my place. He took my place in judgment. He, and so his death stands in the place of my judgment. I don't have to go to hell because Jesus died on the cross for me. He took sin's penalty away. But his resurrection freed me from sin's power. Say sin's power. I don't have to keep living the way I used to live. I don't have to keep 
falling in the same places I always fail. The Lord can free me from the power of my old sins. He can break the grip of bondage and addiction in your life. Jesus can do that for you. Why? Because he rose from the dead. And if he could break the grip of death, he can break the grip of anything in your life. And so the resurrection frees us from sin's power. The death of Jesus freed me from its penalty. The resurrection frees me from its power. And his Holy Spirit will give me victory over sin's pull. Say sin's pull. Does sin ever pull on you? Does your flesh ever pull on you? The Bible says there are fleshly lusts that war against our souls. We're in a battle and the battle is not just outside of us with the world and the devil. The battle is inside of us with the flesh. Galatians 5 says our flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit lusts against the flesh. These two are contrary to one another. There's a war going on inside of us. Our flesh pulling us one way. The spirit of Christ pulling us the other. Amen. And we have to make a daily choice to walk in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh. We have to choose that. But we can choose it because we've been set free to choose it by Christ. You are a new creation. Your new identity is not a license to stop fighting temptation. God's grace doesn't mean permission to sin. It means power to resist temptation to sin. But the truth is, even as born-again believers, sadly, we don't always win the battle with temptation. We don't always. I don't have to lose a battle but if I'm honest, I do lose some battles. How about you? Amen. It's not because God's grace isn't enough or the strength of God's spirit won't help me stand. He will help me stand. But if I'm honest, there are moments that I don't take advantage of that grace or walk in the power of his spirit. And I do make a misstep and end up doing or saying something that displeases the Lord. And I have to repent of that. And I have to get that right with God. Amen. I want to tell you, whenever you stumble as a Christian, the enemy has a fresh opportunity to come in and accuse you because of where you fell. If he can't convince you that your past disqualifies you from being a Christian, he will convince you that your present struggle means that you're not a Christian. And he'll come at you. And he'll try to tell you, you know what? You're not, you can't be a born-again believer. Look at the things that you're still battling and that you're still struggling with. James said, we all stumble in many ways. But he also said, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. The Greek word there is not fault. It's hamartia. It's the word sin. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. I think he's assuming that even Christians will have some sins to confess once in a while. Amen? Didn't Jesus teach us to pray daily and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Sometimes we trespass. We cross a boundary line that we weren't supposed to cross. We get off on somebody else's property. Or we do damage to someone in some way and we have to deal with that. 1 John chapter 2 Pastor John writes to his congregation. He says, I've written these things to you so that you may not sin. But then he puts a comma and says, And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Pastor, what's your point? I'm not urging you to let your guard down against temptation. I want you to walk in victory over sin. I want you to resist temptation. But I also want you to know, I want you to know, and I want you to understand there is more to you than your worst mistake. And even if you have stumbled on the road since you became a Christian, don't let it get in your head to the point that you walk away from Christ. There are people who get saved and they come out of a mess. And they get in church and they begin to walk with the Lord. And then they hit a, a, st a stumbling block and they make a horrible mistake even after they become a Christian. And they get so ashamed and embarrassed over it that they fall out of church and they stop praying and they stop coming to church and they're just so embarrassed that they would ever go back and make a mistake like they had made before they met the Lord that it takes their legs out from under them. Can I tell you today, if you're in this room and you're a Christian and you've stumbled on your journey to follow Christ, 
Something didn't go the way it ought to. You made a horrible mistake. After you became a Christian, can I tell you today, God's grace still abounds to you. He's writing to Christians and he says, I hope you won't sin, but if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What is an advocate? He's a defense attorney. He's a defense attorney. And whenever I've sinned, and I, what do I do? I don't hide it. I don't run from it. I don't try to cover it up. I don't have to make excuses for it. I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to let the guilt or the shame cause me to stop praying or reading my Bible, to stop attending church, to stop living for God. No, I can run to the cross. I can run to the throne of God. And I can fall down before the mercy seat of God. Whenever I come in before the mercy seat, when I come before the throne of God, immediately two people walk into that room. The devil walks into the room and says, Father, he doesn't have the right to be here. He sinned against you. He squandered his inheritance. He's brought your name down. He's done something wrong. He's done what your word says he's not permitted to do. Why is he here? He doesn't have any right to be here. And the truth is I don't. But after the accusation is made, once that district attorney called the devil gets done accusing me immediately my heavenly defense attorney steps up before the judge and says oh that may be true but he rolls up his sleeves and he shows the wounds in his hands and he says but I was wounded for his transgressions I was bruised for his iniquities the chastisement of his peace with God was laid on me and by my stripes his sinful wounded heart is healed and he pleads his blood for me no wonder Charles Wesley said five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Whenever I'm coming before the throne of God, the blood speaks a better word. And I am forgiven and I am permitted and I am given access to the presence of God by the blood of Jesus. Listen, whenever we fail God, we often think that we've let God down or we've disappointed God. I want to tell you something. You can't let God down. You weren't holding God up. Amen? Okay? He's holding you up. You're not holding him up. You're not going to let him down. All right? You're not going to disappoint God because to disappoint God means you would surprise him. You would catch him off guard. You would have done something that he didn't see coming. He saw what you did coming long before you did it. Jesus looked at Simon Peter and said, Before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny me three times. And Peter said, Oh no, Lord, that won't ever happen. And Jesus said, Oh yes, it will. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you, I see it coming. Whenever we fail, it does not catch God by surprise. So don't let it knock you out of church. Don't let it cause you to quit praying. Listen to me. God saw it coming. But he also saw his restoration coming. He didn't just see his sin, he saw his recovery. Say his recovery. Luke 22, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. When you have turned back, say that with me. When you have turned back, not only are you going to fall, you're going to get up. <laughs> Jesus didn't just see your mistake he saw your recovery and he doesn't give up on us and he doesn't wash his hands of us when we fail because not only did he see the mistake coming down the road he saw your recovery when you turn back you will strengthen other people some of you today don't understand that today God is going to use the very struggle and the place where you fail and he's going to dust you off and make you stand there. And not only are you going to do okay, you're going to be the reason that lots of other people do okay. Because you're going to be able to minister to them in the area where you've struggled in your past. Amen. When we fail God and fall into sin, we feel guilt and shame. Guilty for what we did and ashamed that we could become the kind of person capable of such a mistake, such behavior. But when, we've sin when we have sinned, remember... This is what I try to remember. Guilt is true, but shame is a lie. Say that with me. Guilt is true, shame is a lie. Guilt says what I did was wrong. It's okay to admit that. You ought to admit that. That's what it means to confess our sins. Lord, I sinned. What I did was wrong. And I need you to forgive me and strengthen me so I don't keep doing that anymore. That's repentance. 
Guilt is true, but shame is a lie. Guilt says what I did was bad. Shame says because of what I did, I am worthless and unworthy of God's love. That's a lie. That's a lie. Well, I feel worthless and unworthy of God's love. Well, the last I checked, something was worth whatever you'd pay for it. And when I think of the price that God paid for me, I can't look at myself and call myself worthless or unworthy of love. He made me worthy. He determined my value when he purchased me with his own blood on the cross. Hear me today. The answer for guilt and shame is the cross. Isaiah 53, he bore our guilt. Hebrews 12, 2 says, he went to the cross because of our shame. The answer to both of them is Calvary. The answer for us is to believe the gospel, either for the first time or for the hundred and first time. People say, Pastor, why do you preach the gospel so often when most of the people in the room are already saved? Here's why. The gospel is not just how you start. The gospel is how you make it all the way through. We don't ever get over the cross. We don't ever move beyond the cross. The cross is the answer all the way through for us, church. And what we need to believe every morning when we get up is the gospel. And what the devil tries to make you forget every single day of your life is the gospel. When you wake up in the morning and you're numb, the enemy immediately rushes in to remind you of your past mistakes, of how you're feeling, of your current trials, of everything that's going wrong in your life, of how you struggle and don't always measure up. And in that moment, what you need more than anything is to believe the gospel again. To wake up and believe, I may have been everything that you listed, but God has forgiven me of my sins. I may struggle with everything you say I struggle with, but God's grace is able to make me stand. I may be going through hard trial, but it doesn't mean that he has forsaken me or that he doesn't care about me. The cross has answered the question. God loves me, and I know that he does. And so I can get up today in the realization that my past has been forgiven. My current trials are going to work together for my good and God's glory. He's going to give me strength to overcome my struggles. And even if I stumble today, he will not cast me aside. I can repent and get up and he will help me to keep walking for him. Amen. And I know that I am loved and accepted by him, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. And when you start the day believing that, the day starts to get better from the very front end. We don't just need the gospel the night that we get saved. We need the gospel every time we fail. We need the gospel every time we go through difficulty. We need the gospel every day that we wake up. Believe the gospel. Say that with me. Believe the gospel. God doesn't hold up the bar and say, whenever you hit the mark, whenever your behavior measures up to my perfect standard, I will accept you. No. Instead, to everyone who confesses their sins and shortcomings, to everyone who puts all their trust in the sinless life and atoning death of God's Son, Jesus, God accepts them that moment right there by grace through faith. Then, from within the safe place of acceptance, from the security of their new standing in Christ, God begins the work of transforming them into the image of His Son. He justifies us then he sanctifies us. He calls me righteous and then he transforms me and makes me righteous. Lord, help us. Stop looking at yourself in carnival mirrors today. Stop allowing the enemy to twist the truth about who you are and convince you that you are who you were or that you are how you feel or that you are where you fall. Because those three things are not all the truth about you at all. Believe the gospel. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Oh, pastor, I don't know if I can finish this race. The question is not, can you finish the question is, do you believe he can finish what he started? What's the difference? The gospel. The gospel is the difference in those two questions. 
It's not, do I believe I can make it? It's, do I believe he can do what he said? He can make even me stand by his grace. Stop looking in carnival mirrors. You're not who you were. You're not what you feel. You're not where you're tempted to fall. Marshall Seagal says, no, now you are simply his. Instead of believing the lies, anchor your heart in the truth of God's word. You are who he says you are. Understand who you are not so you can embrace the truth about who you are in Christ. Stand with me today. I want to close with this. In Ephesians chapter 1, we'll study this passage in a couple weeks, Lord willing. In Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, I've told you who you're not. Let me give you a glimpse of who you are. Ephesians 1 says you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You are chosen, holy, and blameless in Christ. You were predestined for adoption into God's family in Christ. You have received redemption and forgiveness by the blood of Christ. You have obtained an eternal inheritance in Christ. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption in Christ. Ephesians 1. Or just take the passage we began the day with today and let it be anchored to your heart. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who once had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Would you give Jesus a hand of praise for that truth today? That's who we are. That's who we are. And so I tell you today, I don't just preach the gospel to get people saved. We never move past the gospel and we need the gospel every day of our lives. We need to remind ourselves of it and anchor our hearts in it. Are you here today and you've never trusted Christ as Savior? Maybe the reason the little light on the dash is blinking at you is because something really is wrong. If there's never been a moment in your life when you repented of your sins, when you confessed to God that you were a sinner and you needed a Savior, if there's never been a moment you asked God to forgive you of your sins, if there's never been a time in your life when you knelt and believed with all your heart that what Jesus did by dying and rising again paid the price for your sin, you need to do that today. You need to trust in Christ. You need to repent and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus preached. Repent and believe the gospel. Turn away from your sin and believe that what Jesus did on the cross was enough. Believe that the blood was enough to cleanse you and pay the price for your sin. Maybe you're here today and you need to do that. Let me ask you this. Have you stumbled and failed? Are you struggling with guilt and shame? Even though you did trust Christ in your past? Are you struggling with that today? Remember today, the guilt may be true, but the shame is always a lie. And we confess our sins, and when we do, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But don't let shame cause you to pull away from Christ or to step away from His church. Don't do it. But pastor, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so tired of having to come back to Christ again and again and ask His forgiveness and His grace and His strength. Listen today. The Bible says a righteous man will fall seven times, but he rises every time he falls. The proof that you keep getting up and coming back is the proof that you genuinely do trust Christ and that you really do want to live for God. Get up. Get up. Well, Pastor, I don't want to have to come down there and pray again. I feel like I have to come to the altar every week. You can ride it all the way to heaven. Every week, why do you think I urge you to pray every day? Church, this is how we fight. This is why we read God's Word. We remind ourselves of the gospel every single day. We preach to ourselves. The problem with God's people, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, is we listen to ourselves too much and we don't talk to ourselves enough. 
And instead of listening to ourselves and getting all up in our feelings, we need to stand in front of the mirror and open the Bible and preach to ourselves and say, you're not who you were, you're not how you feel, and you're not where you fall. You were chosen, you were loved, you were accepted in Christ, you were forgiven, you were redeemed, you were transformed. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you are of God and you overcome because of that. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. And even though you're going through all these hard times and difficulties in all these things, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you and gave himself for you. And when you don't feel loved by God, to look in the mirror and say, no, it's a lie. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Preach to yourself the truth. Amen? Are you not experiencing victory over temptation? Cry out to Him to apply that to your heart and life. Have your present trials made you doubt God's love or hindered your faith in prayer? Believe the gospel again. That's the challenge. Would you bow your heart with me? Father, as we prepare to leave this place, but never your presence, I pray today that, God, you would speak to some heart in this room. And, Lord, I pray today if there's one here who's never trusted Christ, this will be the morning. When they come and kneel at the steps here, and they say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I admit that I've sinned and failed you. And, Lord, I ask you today to forgive me of my sin. I believe that the blood of Jesus, what Jesus did by suffering on the cross for me and giving his life was more than enough to cover my sin. And Lord, I put all my hope and trust of ever being forgiven and accepted in what Jesus did for me. And by faith, I received the gift of forgiveness and grace, salvation and eternal life. Lord, let that happen today. But Lord, I pray today if there's a believer here who stumbled since they started, that Lord, today would be the day that they confess their sins and they also deal with the shame. And instead of allowing shame over whatever mistake they've made to pull them away from church and to push them away from Christ, that instead they would come running back to you and they would find, Lord Jesus, that you are their advocate with the Father. You are their heavenly defense attorney. And that your blood will prevail even for them. And the Lord, today their heart can be made clean. and They can regain their confidence in your presence. Lord, I pray today for those who it may not be sin. It may be struggle, hardship, trial. Lord, I pray today that for those who are tempted to believe that God must not love them or God must be against them because of the hard time they're having right now. Lord, I pray for them today that they would believe the gospel again. That the cross forever settles the question. We are radically loved more than we could ever imagine being loved by God. Lord, today, help us to believe that. I don't know who this is for today, but hear me today. If all of God's wrath for sin fell on Christ, then that means none of His wrath for sin falls on you. If Jesus bore it, then you aren't bearing it. So I don't know why you're going through what you're going through, but I know why you're not. And it's not because God's angry or displeased and communicating His rejection to you. No, God wants to come alongside you and strengthen you in the middle of this. Don't pull away from Him. He's not rejecting you. Run toward Him. He will strengthen you and He will get you through it. Father, in the name of Jesus, let us believe the gospel. And even if we believed it years ago, let us believe it again today and every day in Jesus' name. Amen.